day, and thanks for joining us for our Ag Outlook webinar. I'm Jim Minter, Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture and also a Professor of Ag Economics here at Purdue. So, Michael, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the crop outlook mostly, and then we're going to kind of wrap up and uh, maybe kind of review some things that taking place in the livestock sector. There's been a lot of controversy there with respect to what's happened to both meat production and meat prices. So we'll cover that towards the end. But the real news here uh, today is the WASDE report. And actually, this month's WASDE report, the World Ag Supply Demand Estimates from USDA, was a little bit of a not too much news, right? Yes, it's different. <laughs> so let's kind of review what was on the report. So uh, if you look at the 2019 numbers on their report, they had a very small harvested acreage reduction. That was coming out of the, uh, the northern part of the Corn Belt, and there's been a lot of speculation about that all winter in terms of how many of those acres would actually get um, harvested, and there was some resurveying done, and, and they did reduce that, but not very, by very much. They did also reduce the 2019 yield estimate slightly by four-tenths of a bushel per acre. You put those two together, that pulls down 2019 production by about 46 million bushels. Um, I think that's a smaller reduction than a lot of people were hoping for over the course of the winter, but maybe not too surprising. Yeah, the largest reduction was in North Dakota, but still, yeah. maybe a little smaller than people thought it would be. Yeah, certainly if you think back to some of the discussion that was taking place in December and January, I think some people thought that the number uh, reduction might be bigger than that. Um, that reduction in expected usage pushed carryover up a little bit by about 5 million bushels, and so uh, the key there was reducing ethanol usage by about 50 million bushels to 4.9, um, and that still gave a USDA season average price projection at about $3.60 a bushel. So no change there relative to what we thought a month ago. Um, if you look at the 2020 numbers, they really didn't change anything. Uh, season average price projection unchanged at the 320. And of course, the big news on the 2020 crop is really going to happen in a couple of weeks when the acreage report comes out and we find out how many acres actually were planted of both corn and soybeans. And so that news is still ahead of us. Uh, USDA is still basing all their estimates on the planting intentions report, which they released back at the end of March. And we'll talk more about that later, but I think you and I both think that the actual acreages are going to differ somewhat from yes. the intentions that, on that uh, initial report. Looking at the soybean side, no change in harvested acreage, no change in yield, but they did pull production down 5 million bushels uh, total. And that really just is a kind of a rounding error, I guess is how we would put it. If you look at it and, and uh, just taken out the one or two decimal points, no change, but actually behind the scenes, there were some very small changes in both of those that pulled that production down 5 million. Um, they did increase the crush estimate by 15 million bushels, but they reduced exports by 25 million. Net result, expected carryover up 5 million bushels to 585 from 580 a month ago. And the season average price projection for 2019 remained at 850. Uh, looking at the 2019, they did increase the expected crush compared to a month ago, and total usage uh, as a result went up by 15 million bushels. Season average price projection unchanged at 820. Uh, and again, the big news on soybeans really is about two weeks ahead of us in the sense that uh, when we find out what the actual planted acreage is on the acreage report, uh, that's going to give us some new information. And so again, um, we're going to talk more about this later, but you and I think those acreage numbers are going to differ both on the corn and soybean yeah, side. Yeah, we'll get from, into that more from, as the webinar continues here. But one of the things I want to make a, um, a point of at this, at, at this time is we will use the prices that you just went over for corn and soybeans to estimate ARC PLC uh, payments for 2019 yeah, so, and 2020. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Michael, because from a financial projection standpoint, this is a key point uh, right now, is to think about what is going to be the impact of those USDA payments with respect to what that's going to do to your finances. Yes. And so if you just look at the market prices, that's a different picture than what it's going to look like after those payments have been made, uh, both coming out of ARC PLC as well as the, uh, the CARES program or the CARES Act. So just to kind of recap, USDA is still forecasting record large corn production, almost 16 billion bushels, 13.6 uh, from uh, the 2019 crop, as I indicated earlier. That is a small change relative to what they were uh, projecting earlier, but not very much. Um, and, and when you think about what this year's numbers look like, they really do assume two things, trend yields and that people plant what they said they were going to plant yeah. on that acreage uh, intention or planting intentions report. And uh, obviously the yield's somewhat up in the air at this point, uh, and so is the acreage. Yes. 
So let's talk about the acreage a little bit. Um, in March, farmers said they were going to plant 97 million acres of corn and 83 and a half million acres of soybeans, but conditions changed. That's an understatement, right? <laughs> uh, since March 1. And so the real question is, did far farmers really alter their plans from their March intentions? And one thing to think about is the way the price ratios changed over time. So this is a chart that looks at uh, November soybean prices divided by December corn futures prices on a daily basis going back to the beginning of the year. And you can see the change in that price ratio that took place starting in about the middle of March. Um, in mid-March, we were at about, what, a ratio of 2.25, maybe 2.23, and it had been kind of bouncing around between 2.25 and 2.35 for really much of the winter. And then as we got into March and into April, that really changed, and that ratio flipped and went to 2.5 to 2.55 in favor of soybeans over corn. And the question is, was it too late for people to start altering their plans and that's the big question mark that's uh, going to get answered on the plan, planning report. For some people, it certainly was. And, and, and some people, once they get the plans in place, they're very reluctant to change those. But, but as, we've, as we've indicated before in previous webinars, a one to two million acre shift uh, from corn to soybeans could easily happen. Yeah. And, 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 and also, just to reiterate, you pointed this out, Jim, just to reiterate that that, sh that increase to 2.5 was still pretty early in the season. I mean, late March, early April. The planters hadn't rolled the yet. Plan, planters hadn't rolled yet. Plans were made. Yeah. Seed supplies were laid in in, in virtually all uh, situations, but the planters yeah. hadn't rolled. And so was there an opportunity to make some changes? You've looked at the difference in earnings per acre, and uh, I'll let you talk about that. Yes, but until about mid-March, uh, uh, the profitability for corn and soybeans was very similar. And so when I was doing meetings this winter, uh, the, there was almost no discernible bar uh, either green bar or red bar for 2020. Very similar profitability. Oh, did that change. Uh, once we got into late March, early April, that, that uh, price ratio shot to 2.5 and above. Uh, soybeans became more profitable. And, uh, you know, if this pans out, uh, the soybean profitability uh, compared to corn is going to be similar to what it was in 17 and 18. And you remember, those were some very profitable years for soybeans. And so, a bit of a, bit of a change. Uh, in the last two, three months. So to summarize, the economic incentive to switch some of those marginal acres was quite large, was, hard, was very yeah. high. Yeah. And as a result, we think some people responded to that. Yeah. We don't have a good grip on how many, and that's what the acreage report uh, is going to tell us here in a couple of weeks. But uh, we think there's going to be some acreage shift. And we thought all along that it might be in the ballpark of somewhere between one and two million acres. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. But that does alter things. Now, the rest of our slides, we're going to use the USDA numbers. Yes. But keep in mind that the shift could take place as we pull some acres away from corn and put them on the soybean side. So what's happened in the ethanol industry this winter and the early spring has been a huge driver of what's taken place in the corn market. And this slide takes a look at the change in ethanol production on a week-to-week -week basis compared to the first full week of January. So just to reiterate, so you know what you're looking at, we're looking at the percentage change in production for each week compared to that for first full week of January. And so when you look at um, ethanol production, it was really hanging in there pretty well until about the third week of March. And then from that point forward, we started seeing ethanol plants shut down and in other cases, slow down and we saw some weeks there in late, uh, mid to late April, early May, when ethanol production was running at about 45 to 50% below where it was in early January. Notice on the right-hand side, though, ethanol production has come back up. Um, the most recent data we have is from last week, I think, from the uh, Energy Information Agency, down about 24% compared to uh, that first week of January. So. Ethanol production not back to where it was early in the year, but it has come back substantially these last roughly four or five weeks. And I think as we look ahead to the summer, when normally gasoline usage rises, I think there's a chance we could see that come back even more over the next yeah. few weeks. So uh, a bit of optimism there. If you look at gasoline and ethanol prices, those have also bounced back. These are monthly averages as opposed to weekly data. Uh, coming out of uh, Nebraska Energy Statistics, and these are the wholesale prices. So as you look at uh, the unleaded gasoline price up from 63 cents in April to $1.06 in May, 
Um, on the ethanol side, an average of uh, 59 cents in April versus 75 cents in May. And so rebounding, and that's had an impact in terms of profitability for those ethanol plants. So this is based on some data from Iowa State University, the Center for Ag and uh, Rural Development. Uh, on an ongoing basis, estimates daily ethanol plant margins based on prices for ethanol, prices for corn, et cetera. Um, and this is return above operating or variable cost. Now, I want to emphasize that. So this doesn't cover uh, fixed cost or overhead cost for these plants. It's just a return over the variable cost. And the implication is when you see that return uh, level drop below zero, uh, that's an indication those plants are uh, should be in a shutdown mode or certainly uh, considering a shutdown mode. And when you're covering your variable cost, uh, obviously that's making a contribution to those fixed or overhead cost. Notice the shift that's taken place since uh, late March. We were in the red in late March uh, here at uh, early June, um, 20 cents uh, per gallon above, uh, per, per gallon of ethanol produced above break even. Um, not back to the levels we saw in late November, uh, early December when corn prices were quite a bit stronger, but nevertheless a pretty big swing, a pretty big improvement over time. Um, another way to look at the exact same data is to look at that return over operating cost on a dollars per bushel of corn uh, purchased uh, kind of a basis to maybe get a little better impact uh, with respect to what that means in terms of corn prices. And to put that in perspective, I want to back up a little bit. When you see that negative 35 on there, what that really means is for an ethanol plant at that point in time to break even, they would have had to reduce the corn purchase cost by 35 cents a bushel just to break even. Uh, at the moment, they're in a return above their variable cost of about 58 cents per bushel that, of corn that they run through the plant. And again, to keep that in perspective, I think Iowa State estimates that the overhead cost for most plants on average is probably somewhere in the ballpark of about 25 cents uh, per gallon of ethanol. So kind of keep that, that thought in mind, that uh, these numbers don't uh, reflect a return to that fixed cost or that uh, overhead cost. But nevertheless, you can kind of get an idea as to what the impact that's starting to have on corn prices, right? That's a, that's a positive for corn prices throughout the Corn Belt. Uh, and, and if we're going to see additional strength in corn, one of the things we do need to see is uh, some additional strength in the ethanol And we have seen some strength market. in corn recently, and so I, I think this helps explain, explain that. Yeah, so uh, you and I were looking at that with respect to futures prices recently. I think uh, as of uh, this morning, um, July corn, relative to the low that we put in back in late April, up about, uh, I think, roughly 25 cents. 10 cents, wasn't it? Soybeans was up 25, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, 10 yeah. cents. But still, I mean, that, that's yeah, uh, yeah. very helpful. So we've seen some improvement on, on both corn and soybeans uh, relative to, the, to what's taking place in late April. So um, just to give you a little idea as to how much corn we use for ethanol, USDA is forecasting this year's usage coming down a little bit compared to where they were a month ago. A month ago, they were at 4.95 billion bushels. This month, they're at 4.9 for the 2019 crop. Uh, and to keep that in mind, that's kind of in the ballpark of what we've been talking about going yes. back to March. We thought it'd be in the ballpark of about 5 billion bushels. They're a little bit below that now. They're forecasting a rebound of 300 million bushels for the 2020 crop. Uh, thinking back to those previous charts, what they're actually suggesting is we're going to see some continued improvement in those fuel prices, continued improvement in demand for ethanol, and that pushing those ethanol uh, consumption numbers, corn use Closer for ethanol. to capacity, in other yeah, words. Yeah, closer to capacity. Yeah. But, uh, so one, one way to look at that is that's kind of optimistic compared to the 2019 crop. I think when we were talking about this earlier, Michael, you had a little different perspective. Yeah, I, I was looking at the 17-18 bars compared to 20, and so we're not back where we were in 17-18. In other words, we got a ways to go. Yes. Yeah. So. You know, helping explain why corn prices are relatively weak this year, and, and that could continue for a while. Yeah, good point. And you can see that in the basis numbers. So this is uh, uh, Eastern Corn Belt basis. This is based on the basis tool that uh, Nathan Thompson maintains on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. He updates that every week. I, I think he updated the numbers this morning for this week's uh, estimates. And you can see what's happened to the corn basis. Corn basis going back to early March was way above the three-year average. Uh, came down sharply as those ethanol plants were backing off and, and shutting down as demand was uh, really evaporating, so to speak, with respect to ethanol usage here in the Eastern Corn Belt. 
And we've seen some recovery recently, right? So as, as ethanol production has come back, we have seen some improvement. Some of that's on a seasonal basis. We've kind of flirted with being a little bit above the three-year average. I think it's safe to say, though, as we look ahead to the rest of the summer, we're not going to see the spread come back with respect to the strength and corn basis levels that we were seeing earlier. We were uh, way above the three-year average all through this marketing year. Um, we might see those basis levels go above the three-year average here the next few weeks, but not by the magnitude that we saw earlier in the marketing year. We've lost that opportunity, I think, uh, for the 2019 crop. Um, if you think about the export side, you know, exports, uh, again, USDA is forecasting a, a pretty strong rebound in corn exports in the 2020 marketing year. And that still implies some demand recovery in those importing countries. And I guess that's, that's a tough one to forecast <laughs> at this stage, right, with, with respect to what's going on with the uh, coronavirus. Like Chris Hurt used to say, uh, the cure for low prices is low prices. And so part of that's got to be the fact that, that corn prices are relatively ro low right now and some, and some countries are going to take advantage of that. Good point, but it is going to take income. Oh, yes. That, that, that's another wild card here we should talk about. That's the challenge. Yes. Because uh, when, th when you think about corn exports, why do we export corn? It's, meat. It goes into livestock yeah, goes production into livestock and meat production. consumption, and that's heavily yeah, tied or yeah. tightly tied to uh, income So that's levels. a number we'll definitely want to watch here in, in future webinars. Um, strong feed demand projected, and that's really based on the fact that to date we haven't seen any significant indication of uh, a large livestock liquidation here in the U.S. And, and just to backtrack a little bit, coming into this year, we were forecasting and anticipating record large meat production here in the U.S., and we haven't seen much indication so far that producers have backed away from that in terms of liquidating. Uh, and that means feed demand remaining relatively strong here for uh, the 19 crop. And actually, they're showing some, some rebound into the 2020 crop. And I guess that's the part that I'm a little bit concerned about. Again, part of that's based on continued growth in, in uh, meat exports. Yeah. And that's the part that's tenuous. So where does this leave us in terms of ending stocks and prices? So ending stocks projected uh, coming out of the 19 crop going into the 2020 crop year at 15%, no real change there, 22% for the 2020 crop. And as you look at that chart, you realize that puts us in territory we haven't been in in a long time. And I didn't put the total history is, but you have to go back a long, long ways before you saw those kind of carryover levels. And uh, that explains why they've pulled back here these last couple of months, the season average marketing year uh, uh, price for corn to 320 for the 2020 crop from that 360 yeah. for the 2019 crop. And we don't have a chart for the international uh, stocks to use, but, but also that's fairly strong too. Yeah, so that's, that's the issue. It's a, a big rise in ending stocks uh, on the na international basis, I guess I forgot to put that chart in, Michael, but um, the rise there is, is much smaller, yeah. as you would expect. But it's still some pretty, pretty, pretty large percentages. It's, it's, it's a healthy uh, carryover on a worldwide basis. Um, if you look at soybean exports, and switching gears here and, and talking about soybeans, 24% um, increase from this year's rather low level forecast for the upcoming year. And again, there's some optimism built into that, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and some optimism really based on, on one country, right? They're really anticipating we're going to see a recovery in exports to China. Um, that remains to be seen, yeah. right? And uh, yeah. those of you watching this webinar, there's news about what's taking place with respect to China's purchases almost every day, it seems like. So that was, that's still an unknown as to whether or not we're going to see that kind of a rebound in the exports. But that's going to make a big difference if we don't, right? So Yeah. Um, 820 marketing year average projection for 2020. That's the lowest since 2006. But the interesting thing about that chart is the ending stocks percentage. 18, 23%, 19, 15%, and projected as of right now, 9%. Now we think there's gonna be more soybeans planted in this 2020 crop than what USDA is currently projecting. And you were looking at that earlier today, Michael. If you added 1 million acres, for example, that would take the, uh, the, the stocks to use up to 10%. If you added 2 million acres, that would take us up to 11%. The point is, it's still relatively low uh, compared to, to where we were in 19. 
Yeah, so it creates some optimism it's there. Right. I think there's definitely a different picture when you look at corn versus soybeans, and, and it probably helps uh, helps explain why soybean prices have rallied more recently than corn prices. Yeah, good point. So basis uh, story on soybeans a little different than corn. Corn, remember, basis dropped sharply as we headed into the shutdowns for those ethanol plants in, in March and April. Soybean basis has weakened somewhat relative to where it was in uh, late winter, uh, but still retains a healthy premium over the longer term average. And I think, you know, one of the things to keep in mind, this is based on some of the research that Nathan Thompson's done here at, at uh, Purdue. Uh, as you head into the summer, the risk of uh, basis swings and volatility in, in prices increases rather substantially. Um, in fact, the work that uh, Nathan had done, I think, suggested pretty strongly that returns were positive for storing into that late spring period. But as you got into the summer, it was very risky and very unpredictable. So keep that in mind. It's tougher to forecast basis for, for example, late June, July, and August than it is to forecast basis earlier in the year. Uh, just a riskier environment. I'm going to put you on a spot here, Jim. I mean, we, we both know some people that have some 19 soybeans. Uh, what would you suggest they think about doing with those 19 soybeans? Well, let's back up a little bit and think about what's happened uh, with respect to basis and what's happened with respect to futures prices. Yes. Futures prices for both corn and soybeans have rallied somewhat. And I think since soybeans is about 25 cents on on old crop, and was it about 30 cents on new crop? I think that's right. Yeah, and that looking at uh, not actually settlements for today, yeah. but where, where it was about two hours ago. And if you look at that as well as the strength and basis, and then maybe combine that with some research again that Nathan Thompson did here at Purdue and Chad Hart at Iowa State University, and Chad was a speaker at our top farmer conference this past winter. One of the things he talked about on a seasonal basis was, did you want to price at about this time of year? And I guess we're going to throw one more piece of information in there, and that is the fact that uh, notwithstanding the tropical storm that passed through last week, there's some indication that we're getting drier. Yes. So this is that environment where we have a tendency almost every year to see some kind of a rally take place with respect to crop prices. And I'm not going to say we su you should sell today, but I think you should be looking very hard at whether or not this is going to be the time for that rally over the next week, maybe yeah. the next two weeks. And, and then couple that with what you said earlier, the riskiness of holding those soybeans into late July, early August if you have 19 crop. Yeah. Because it's very real. I've seen, I've seen those charts. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think both of us feel like... Um, we're not ready to say you should sell today. One of the one of the challenges we're both fundamental economists, so yeah. <laughs> fundamental economics isn't very good at telling you whether or not today is the day to sell. But from a longer term perspective, this is the time when you want to be moving. And so whether you choose to move today, maybe wait a few days, see how the weather plays out, over the next week or two could be a good opportunity to move out those remaining old crop supplies, and perhaps do some pricing on the new crop. So let's talk a little bit about the government program side because that's going to have a big impact on farmers' actual income this year. It's not just what takes place on the crop side. We're going to spend a couple slides here reviewing uh, the main government programs that, that we're looking at in 2020, uh, looking at uh, the CARES Act and CCC uh, funds, the CFAP overview. Uh, application period opened uh, May 26 and ends August 28th, so keep that in mind. Uh, there is, it is a single payment uh, based on the CARES Act funds and CCC funds. Uh, the eligible inventory, there's much more information on the internet related to this, but just to summarize that real briefly, it's the lower of self-certified unpriced inventory as of January 15th or 50% of 2019 production. And so if you look at the, using that information, the average payment rate uh, is, is, uh, uh, is is 0.335 per bushel of eligible inventory and 0.475 per bushel for eligible inventory of soybeans. Notice my my uh, my parentheses there, eligible inventory. And so, uh, for some people, that's going to be 50% of your uh, 2000. You 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 had a, you had quite a bit of inventory, so it's going to be 50% of 2019 production. Uh, some of the people that sold uh, a, a large percentage of their crop before January 15th, it's just going to be the portion that you hadn't sold before January 15th. 
Okay, so then let's come back and think about Arc County and PLC, because we've been getting some questions about yes. that. There's been some emails come in wondering how this is going to play out, so let's look at that a little bit. We had recommended uh, choosing Arc County for soybeans, and so let's just review that briefly. Uh, payments occur when actual crop revenue is below Arc County guarantee. It's based on county yields and marketing year average U.S. prices. That's why I made a, a, a note earlier uh, that we're going to use those prices 850 for 19 and 820 for 20 in the computations for our county for soybeans. Uh, we recommended PLC for corn and I, I think so far that was a really good choice. Uh, payments occur if if higher of U.S. average market price for the crop for the crop year um, is lower than the, the crop's reference price. That's 370 for corn and 840 for soybeans, but here we're focusing on corn. Uh, corn price both in 19 and 20 is below 370, quite a bit below 370 uh, in 2020. At least that's the current projection. Uh, the payment is, is based on PLC program yield, which is farm specific, and marketing year average U.S. prices. And so, Michael, just to kind of reiterate, the reason we're focusing on Arc County for soybeans and PLC for corn is we think the vast majority of people chose, chose Arc County for programs. soybeans and the vast majority of people chose PLC for yeah. corn. And so looking at some possible payments here, this is for White County, Indiana, and so this is going to vary, uh, vary by county, uh, depending on where you're at in the Corn Belt and the Plains. Uh, but what I did here, this is a pretty complicated chart, so let me, uh, let me take some time to explain it. I assumed the marketing year average 2019 corn price was going to be 360. That's coming off the WASD balance sheet uh, for June. Uh, and then I looked at possible uh, 2020 corn prices going from $3 to $3.80 uh, with, with the, the center price being $3.40 there. And obviously, if we stay uh, with relatively low, like $3.20, for example, uh, we'd expect some pretty high payments uh, for, for PLC on the corn program, approximately $60 to $65. Uh, if, if price would drop to $3, we're not necessarily anticipating that, uh, but you can paint a picture where that's certainly possible. The PLC payment would jump to $90, and so very, very dependent on, on corn prices with some higher payments uh, occurring if we stay $320 or below. Uh, looking at uh, looking at soybeans again for White County and and here we're going to focus on the Arc County numbers. But we assumed a, a 2019 marketing year average soybean price of eight dollars and fifty cents. That's off the WASDE balance sheet again. Um, looking at uh, uh, current soybean prices, they're, they're, it's in at eight twenty is where the WASDE report is, and so we're we're kind of between uh, two of my prices here for 2020, eight dollars and eight fifty. Uh, but with, 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 but uh, if you look at eight dollars, uh, with eight dollars you'd have an Arc County payment for 2020 of approximately $25. And so in this particular case, we're looking at an Arc County payment that's about half of that, you know, split the difference between $8 and $8.50, maybe about $12 to $13 uh, with that $8.20 price. But, but the point is, is, is we are expecting a payment uh, for 2020. And this graph also, notice that for this particular county, and this is true for a lot of counties I've looked at in Indiana at least, uh, there's a 19 Arc County payment. Uh, and it's not trivial. Uh, that's close to $30 in this particular case. Yeah, and so one thing to remember is those 2019 payments will be made in October yes. of 2020. So those will be cash flow dollars that are going to help out uh, this fall. And, and uh, in some cases, I think maybe yeah. people don't really have a good grip on how yeah. big that amount might be. And so the, PL, the PLC payment for corn is going to be relatively small. Uh, in October, but it's that payment, uh, you know, October 2021 for the 20 crop, we're expecting that to be relatively large. Yeah, good point. So let's just summarize for this case farm what, what, what the possible payments might be uh, for 19 and 20. Notice I say projected here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking at Arc County PL, and PLC, MFP, and uh, CFAP. Now, uh, I, the, uh, to understand this slide, uh, we need to understand what I did here is I looked at the payments for corn and soybeans and just assumed, and just averaged them because I'm assuming we're in a corn soybean rotation. So these are the average payments for corn and soybeans. I realize in 2019, for example, uh, that a lot of that, that uh, you know, 2018 rather, a lot of that payment went to soybeans, very little to corn. I'm averaging them. And so, so keep that in mind when you're reading this. Uh, in 2018, uh, nothing for our County PLC, uh, $52 payment for the market facilitation program. Uh, 2019, uh, uh, this is a, a $20 payment. This is the 19 crop. 
uh, which will get this payment uh, you know, later this year. Uh, Arc County and POC was $20, uh, and the MFP payment uh, was, was $62, so very, very healthy MFP payment again in 2019. In 2020, uh, the Arc County PLC, this is the 2020 crop, so this wouldn't be received until 2021 in terms of the Arc County PLC. Uh, the Arc County and PLC payment is larger, uh, with a, most of that going to corn, uh, corn payment uh, for, for this particular uh, county, White County, Indiana, being about $60 and, and the uh, uh, soybean payment closer to $20. And so some pretty healthy payments there. Uh, the CFAP payment, uh, $21. If you add all those up, uh, the 2020 payment is still quite a bit lower than the 19 payment. So maybe we'll get some MFP later this year. That's, that's yet to be determined, but it's certainly possible. Uh, and I, whether it's MFP or something else, there's yes. a possibility of another program being passed. So that's, I just wanted to summarize the what air. the payments in 2020 look like uh, compared to the previous two years. All right, let's do some net return projections and do some definitions. Yeah, I'm going to incorporate the government payments in in the net return projection. So when you're looking at net farm income, this is a this is the income off an income statement. So it's accrual net farm income, uh, gross revenue minus cash expenses and depreciation. It excludes operator and family labor, and then opportunity costs on machinery and land. And so if you own your land, for example, uh, there's not a charge for that in the net farm income computations. However, uh, in the net return to land and earnings, those opportunity costs, such as the opportunity costs on owned land, are, are included uh, in, in those estimates. And so that's the main difference between the first one and the second and third net return to land and earnings. So with that, uh, I have a very busy slide here that we've been uh, talking about in, in, the, in previous webinars, net farm income sources from this case farm. Uh, so I just want to look at what 2020 looks like compared to uh, uh, other years going back to 2007. Uh, the little triangle here is the actual net farm income, and then I've split the net farm income into government payments, crop insurance, and crop net returns. Uh, crop net returns in 2020 do not look very good, and uh, they're not as bad as what they were in 2015, a very wet uh, June uh, occurred in 2015 uh, for this case farm, so that was not a very good year. Uh, and so if you combine the, the, the crop insurance with the crop net returns in 2020, we're looking at a similar, uh, similar profitability to 2015, which is certainly not good news. The other point to make here is even with some fairly big uh, government payments from Arc County PLC and, and the CFAP program, um, we're still looking at a net farm, a net farm income that's substantially lower uh, than what we received in 2018 and 2019. Yeah, as I look at that chart, Michael, I think that's what jumps out at me is the fact that you've really only got two uh, years on there where the net farm income is actually negative. And, and tentatively, that's the projection for 2020. The only year on the chart going back to 2007 where that was true was 2015. So um, that spells a pretty challenging year, even with the current round of government payments yeah. projected in there. So. Uh, looking at the profit margin, uh, the profit margin is, is used quite a bit at, uh, uh, to compare profitability over time and then to compare with, with, with other farms. Uh, here we're looking at profit, profit margin ratio for the same case farm since 2007. Obviously from 2007 to 2013, very strong profit margin. Uh, profit margin has been below uh, the long-term average here since 2013. Nothing real surprising there. But it again points out the fact that, that 2020 looks really bad and, and, and it's almost as bad as what 2015 was. And so yeah. that's the only two years again with a negative profit margin. And when the profit margin is negative, essentially what that tells us is net farm income plus interest could not cover family living expenses. And we've got to remember, uh, we also use we also use the the operating profit to to repay debt, uh, to buy assets, and so when you're already in a situation where you're not fully covering family living, there's not a lot of money left uh, for these other things. And so it's a classic where so you're, you're drawing down working capital, taking taking uh, uh, money from elsewhere and reducing capex. Yes. Looking at ca cash rent and net return to land. Um, uh, 20, this just shows you 2020 is, is quite a bit below 18 and 19. And the main reason for showing this is if you, if you look back at, at 14 and 15 there and 16, uh, after that very low return in 15, we saw a rather large decline in cash rent uh, from 15 to 16. 
And usually, usually when you look at this relationship, I probably should have lagged uh, the, the net return to land. Usually a low net return to land for 15, for example, has an impact on cash rent for 16. And so you're looking at 2020, that's going to have an impact on 2021 and so on. And so that's typically how, how you look at this. But, but my point here is we had a pretty large decline in cash rent after that at low net return in, in 2015, unless something changes here, some additional government payments, uh, corn yields higher than what we expect them to be, higher corn prices, something like that. Uh, we're looking at some downward, serious downward pressure for cash rents uh, again in 2021. And so uh, the corollary to that is on the May survey for the Ag Economy Barometer, we asked people that rent farmland what they expected to do with respect to cash rent for the 2021 crop year. And a little over one out of four, I think 27% of the response in that survey said that they expected to try and negotiate a lower cash rent yes. for 2021. That's think, consistent with what you got here. I think here. two thirds said they, they weren't going to, but we didn't ask them uh, how many of those contracts were longer term. You know, perhaps, perhaps they were in a uh, you know, first or second year of a three-year contract or something like that. That would be very difficult to negotiate that. Uh, but, but, but I'm assuming that some of those that are an annual would be more likely to renegotiate. Yeah. And truthfully, but that's a good point. If, if one out of four are going to negotiate it, that's enough to pull down that average. Yes, certainly yeah. is. Um, when we look at cash rent, sometimes we, we talk about downward pressure on cash rent. We, we necessarily assume that there's, there's also downward pressure on land value, and, and they often do move in the same direction. Uh, but before I cover this slide, just remember from 2006 to 2014, when land prices were going up rather dramatically in the Corn Belt, land prices went up faster than cash rent. Why? primarily because interest rates were dropping. And so, and so land values, there's a lot more factors impacting land values than just cash rent. And so I'll jump down to the negative influences there. Certainly the relatively low net returns to land, uh, you know, downward pressure on cash rent, uh, you know, couple that with the fact that working capital is, is very depressed for a fairly uh, large percentage of farms. Uh, those are definite negative influences on land. However, uh, there is several positive influences which are very important to keep in mind. Land is a very thin market. A very small percent of land gets turned over in a given year. Um, and, and, there, and anecdotal evidence, evidence suggests that there's a very low supply of land for sale right now. And so not a low supply even, even in this thin market. Interest rates remain low and Federal Reserve policy suggests that interest rates are not going to increase uh, certainly not for the next year to year and a half, and so and so that's going to be there uh, helping support land values. Land is a very good hedge against inflation. In fact, uh, some research we've done recently suggests it's a better hedge against inflation than gold. That's saying something. And so uh, Federal Reserve policies uh, uh, in response to the COVID could increase uh, uh, inflation. Uh, hopefully not, but it's, it's certainly some potential there uh, compared to where we've been. That, that would, that's a positive for land. And then finally, uh, there's been quite a bit of, of, of interest from in institutional investors. Uh, you know, uh, purchasing land, uh, that's still there. Uh, you know, let's just, just reiterate why uh, institutional investors may be interested in land. Uh, there's a couple things going on there. First, if you look at the rate of return for land compared to the stock market, for example, land is pretty competitive. You know, going back to 1960, for example, land's pretty competitive with the stock market. Uh, but also, uh, land land uh, rates of return for land are not correlated with the stock market. And so, from an investment standpoint, that's a good thing. We want to combine assets that are not correlated, that don't track one another. And so if the stock market goes up, land still holding its value and, and vice versa. And so, and so there still remains a, a, you know, some uh, interest from institutional investors uh, in terms of purchasing land. You sum all this up, I think you're looking at a situation where uh, we have downward pressure on cash rent, but land values are, could be relatively stable. You know, and Michael, as I think about that, I think the real driver, the biggest one out there, is the low interest rates. Yes, definitely. And the commitment to keep interest rates low for the next several years. And so um, I agree with you. I think the yeah. downward pressure yeah. on land yeah. prices will yeah. be minimal, and, but we will see some downward pressure and, and on And low cash interest rent. rates, it's not just land. That's helping the stock market. Oh, That's helping real estate, commercial assets real estate. General, right. That's helping your housing, <laughs> house prices. And so it's, it's all assets. Yeah. All right, let's uh, turn our attention, talk a little bit about the livestock sector. So 
Last month, we brought up some issues with respect to what's taking place with meat production and meat prices, and we wanted to recap. Things have changed quite a bit over the last few weeks. So this looks at uh, red meat production, beef and pork production combined on a weekly basis at the federally inspected plants around the nation. And you can see those red dots indicate the 2020 levels on a week by week basis and notice how they have rebounded and gone back to year ago levels. So we were running way below a year ago uh, in mid April, for example. Uh, now we're back to approximately where we were at this time last year and that's changed things quite a bit. Similar story, the reduction in, in poultry was never as severe as what we saw in the beef and pork markets, uh, but nevertheless, we've got production back to roughly year ago levels. And um, as you look at what that meant for prices, initially pork cutout, pol pork wholesale values on an average basis rose dramatically as those production levels came down. As production has come back up, not too surprisingly, those wholesale pork values have, have fallen back and actually a little bit below where we were this time last year. Um, slaughter hog prices, similar story in terms of the pattern, uh, but we've got those prices below where they were this time last year. And again, keep in, point, keep in mind that coming into this year, when we get those levels back, uh, we came back into this year expecting some record large uh, meat production. So that's one of the things that's kind of holding things back a little bit, and the other thing is what's taking place on the we export side. We were talking side. about China earlier. It's not just soybeans where there's a lot of hope uh, for China. It's also pork. Yeah. We've been exporting a lot of pork uh, to China, and certainly uh, certainly that would really help pork prices if we continue to do that. And, and in general, the pork market has become very dependent on what happens in the export yes. channel. That's been a dramatic change over the last couple of decades, uh, the importance of uh, exports to meat in general, but especially pork. Um, on the beef side, uh, those box beef cutout values, again, rose sharply as those production levels were coming down. And then as they've come back up, we've seen those wholesale box beef cutout values decline rather sharply, but they're still not back to where they were this time last year. Slaughter steer prices have come back to about where they were this time last year. Uh, Michael and I were talking earlier about feeder steer prices. We didn't put a feeder steer price chart in. Feeder steers, uh, in like in the Southern Plains, for example, are still running below last year's level. But slaughter steer prices have come back to where they were this time and th last and year. And that's largely a result of the red ink we're seeing in the feedlots right now. They're, they're not about to, to be real aggressive bidding up those, those feeders when you're, when you're facing a lot of red ink. Yeah, it's been a challenging, very yeah. challenging environment in, in the feedlot sector here recently. All right, that kind of wraps up our discussion. Uh, our next webinar will be in mid-July, July 13. Uh, that time we'll have a, a new WASDE report, so a new sub set of supply and demand estimates. And those supply and demand estimates will incorporate the information from the acreage report, which comes out at the end of June. And in the interim, I think, Michael, we'll probably have a posting um, on, on the website with yep. respect to following that acreage report. And, of course, a podcast uh, discussing those implications as well. So uh, more information on our, our uh, website, uh, the Purdue.ag commercial, uh, commercial Ag, or you can go straight to the webinar as it indicates on the screen. So with that, uh, thanks for joining us. And on behalf of my colleague, Michael Langemeyer, I'm Jim Minter. Thanks for joining us.